Good evening, I'm Jim Whaley. Tonight it's a pleasure to welcome as my guest on Cinema Showcase one of America's great entertainers, Mr. Sid Caesar. A great success in films, on Broadway, on television. Right now he's starring at the Harlequin Dinner Theater in Neil Simon's Prisoner of Second Avenue. I hope you will join me tonight as I talk with Sid Caesar on Cinema Showcase. Thank you very much for joining Cinema Showcase tonight, and right now, join me in welcoming to the program, Mr. Sid Caesar. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Jim. You know, I am a, and have long been a Neil Simon fan, and I guess there hasn't been a more successful playwright than Simon over the past couple of decades, yet there are still some critics who, for some reason, don't take Simon's comedy seriously, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, Neil used to write for me. Neil Simon wrote for me for uh, eight years. Mm -hmm. And Neil is a very, uh, well, he's a, I would say he's a, uh, a technician who knows his craft and uh, is trying, but it's very slowly he's trying to get deeper into deeper subjects. But he's very well uh, equipped and very well, uh, I would say, uh, stationed in life to, uh, to write about what he's writing. He's, yeah. uh, I think, uh, a tremendous writer in what he's doing. Absolutely. And. Uh, I think uh, when all these writers, like uh, Woody Allen, who also wrote for me, and uh, Mel Brooks, who wrote for me, and um, let's see, Larry Gelbart, who, did, who was doing MASH now, wrote mm -hmm. for me, and uh, quite a few other writers, we all wrote together. And uh, sometimes we'd kid around and say, well, let's write something very serious. And we couldn't keep it serious because <laughs> we, had, <laughs> we weren't serious. We weren't Tolstoy's, we weren't <laughs> Kafka's or Dostoevsky. But uh, they try once in a while, and sometimes they uh, they can combine the uh, the the, uh, the drama mm -hmm. and and the comedy. It's very rare when you can. Uh, it's it's a very unique situation. Uh, I think Chaplin did it uh, in City Lights, where he bought the uh, violets from the blind oh. girl, yeah. and uh, she didn't. You know, he was a blind. She was blind, and he came up and bought the violets, and then. He wanted to make impression that he was a big man. And this is what took, to me, imagination genius. How do you show a blind girl in a silent movie <laughs> that you're rich? Mm -hmm. Remember when he ran through the car and he slammed the door? Well, in those days, if you had a car, you were a rich man. But yeah. to have a car of a limousine, well, the sound of that closing was what made her think that he was a millionaire. And when she took the, uh, he bought the violets and then she rinsed out the cup and she didn't see, and she just threw the water and went in his face. And you didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Yeah, that to me is the epitome, right there. I guess when you can, um, in comedy, when you can, when you can relate it to to everyday human experience. Well, that's what comedy is. That's what uh, really what comedy is, because comedy is supposed to be to show you that you're not alone in things, and also to show you that life is not that serious. I mean, you can sit and say well, everything is serious. You know, you have an eyelash fall out. My God, will it grow back? You know. <laughs> But uh, you can't take life too seriously because there's fun to be had in life. And uh, the, if it's best when you can laugh at yourself because mm -hmm. if you laugh at yourself, then you know that you're secure enough to laugh at yourself. Uh, a person that's not uh, secure or insecure, if, uh, if there's a joke that pertains to what he's thinking about or what he's doing, he may take it personally because he's offended, because mm -hmm. it hits him personally. But another person who is secure We'll find some. Hey, that's what I do, or that's what uh, my uncle Harry does, or what uh, Aunt Jenny does, or whatever. And uh, yeah, that's it. And I do it once in a while too. If you can do that, then you know that uh, you're a little secure. Not everyone is all secure. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you think though that's why Frank Capra's films, for one, were so successful in the uh, in the 30s and 40s? Well, Frank uh, Frank Capra did. Uh, he showed uh, what you can look for, the fantasy of what mm -hmm. you can think about. And he showed it in a, in a good way because uh, he made it uh, stylized. It was very stylized you know, to show that it was a fantasy of not real life. 
but it was things that people dream about. You know, to have a penthouse, to have this kind of yeah. a relationship, to have that. Uh, well, uh, it's good to dream. In fact, it's good to, if you don't dream, if you don't have uh, any aspirations or any hopes, you can't, what's the sense of going on? In fact, you have he, to. he made probably, I, I know it's wrong to have favorite f favorites of anything, but he made what comes closest to being my favorite film, and that's It's a Wonderful Life. Oh, yeah. With James Stewart. Yeah. Marvelous film. And he made a lot of great films. There were a lot of great pictures that came out of Hollywood and all over the world. Yeah. And they're coming out more and more. Remember, it was the Italian uh, right. influence that the came out. Right, the neorealism. Right. And uh, now it's the Swedish. Uh, yeah. with just a picture of through an eye cup, through the holder of a cup, <laughs> through the eye of a needle, through another flower, and then you'll see what a guy's <laughs> blowing his nose. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the early 50s are often talked about, in retrospect, as having been the, the golden age of television. Do you think that? Well, there is no golden age of any time. I mean, there, there's a golden age of Pericles, <laughs> <laughs> which wasn't too, uh, I wouldn't want to live then. But uh, there was a certain, uh, I think, a certain uh, aura about uh, those days because it was live. And there's a great difference between live and tape. Mm -hmm. Because you, tape, you can do it again. Uh, you can, and it's mostly you can, most of the shows, uh, they have the teleprompter or they have the... Uh, and you know that when you're when You you're can see because yeah. if I'm talking to you, I'm looking right here. Well, hello, Jim. Gee, it's very nice to see you. I'm glad you came to make it today. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have the impact of me looking right at you and eye to eye. Mm -hmm. Whereas in those days, we had, a we had no teleprompter, we had no cards. And yeah. the show was an hour and a half long every week. Not for 20 weeks or 22 weeks, yeah. but 39 weeks. Now you have 18 years of that. Oh, <laughs> incredible. And not only that, but you have to write it every week and block it and stage it. And I didn't do it by myself. I mean, I, had, yeah. I was very fortunate to have uh, men like Max Liebman and uh, well, I had the cast of Imogene Coker, mm -hmm. Carl Reiner, Howard Morris, and the writers I just mentioned and some other writers. So I was very fortunate in uh, being uh, in that era. Maybe that's one of the things I'm talking about, people of that caliber all together at the same time. Yeah, it's very unusual that you get, uh, that you get well, it comes from within. It's uh, everybody gives. Everybody tries to make it better. Nobody's mm -hmm. doing it just to. No, it's my joke. It's my. No, it's my idea. It's just forget it. If I had an idea and I said, let's try that. If it didn't work out, if he said, no, your idea is better. Let's try that because the show is the main thing. The show is the thing. Mm -hmm. It's not if my idea is better than his. You know, maybe we'll file mine if this is better now, and yeah. maybe when we're stuck someday, we'll, we'll take it out. But you know, it must be gratifying. <coughs> it must be gratifying to to know that your show, your show of shows is constantly thought of as, as sort of the, the epitome of that sort of humor. Because I remember when the Dick Van Dyke show came along, they all, they all said, uh, not since Sid Caesar have we seen such a great collaborative effort. Well, uh, you remember Carl Reiner was, uh, was uh, the producer on that show. Yeah. So Carl took with him what he learned mm -hmm. at, uh, on the show shows on Caesar's Hour, which is uh, nothing bad, yeah. which is good. Yeah. What kind of state do you think TV is in today as far as comedy goes? Well, I'd rather not say. <laughs> <laughs> could it's could be. Uh, it's not for me. To say. I'm not a critic. I'm not. Uh, I just think it's in a dormant state. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I wonder if it's is it is it going anywhere? Is it going to get worse before it gets better? Or I have no idea. Yeah. The only thing that hits me right away is that music today. I mean, just the pop numbers. Yeah. Uh, there are no endings anymore. <laughs> Every song fades out, right? <laughs> that is true. <laughs> That's it. There's no more endings. And it's like sketches today, you see, uh, on some scenes. Is they no ending. Well, what do you want to go? You want to do this now, Tom? Or what? Hey, this, this, what do you say we end a sketch right here? Yeah, I don't want to go on. Okay, let's call it off. Bang. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, to me, it uh, may be the new style, but yeah. I still think it's a cop out. Remember when I did an interview? Because if you can't write something that you can finish, don't write why, it. Why write why it? Write yeah. it? Yeah. Why write you know, it? Why get the people all excited about, hey, it's a good idea, and yeah. then not follow through and not end it? Yeah. I did an interview um, a year or so ago with Imogene Coca, and she said to me that while, of course, there were days which were very tough doing your show, she said one of the great things about it was that she always went to work with the knowledge that today it's really going to be creative, that somehow she had that in her mind that... Uh, you know, what she was doing was important. Mm -hmm. And I think that's marvelous if you can go to work with that attitude. Well, that's what we all, because we had to be creative because we had nothing on paper. So you've got to be creative. <laughs> <laughs> There's no other question. 
uh, no, when you uh, go to work like that, and so it's, it's a challenge to go to work yeah. like that. I didn't go to work with that feeling every day. I'd, well, sometimes I go to work with the dread to say, yeah. how are we going to come up with something that we haven't got yet? Yeah. But uh, I'm reviewing all my, uh, all the, I have all the kinescopes of all the shows, and in reviewing some of them, I found that about a good 75% of the material holds up today. In fact, it's very good. And there's 25% that I would say, not so high. Well, wasn't there was a theatrical release not long back, I think. Yeah, we put out the 10th show show of shows. And that wasn't the 10 best. Mm -hmm. That was just 10. How did you go about it? Did you select those? Or? Well, Max and myself, uh, we selected the material. And we just, you know, we, we had to make compromises because you just can't fit it in. This may be too much like that. That one, may, that sketch may be too much like mm -hmm. this. And also we had to have, uh, you had two strong scenes back to back. They cancel each other. Yeah. So you have to have peaks and valleys. So you have a scene that doesn't is not in competition with this. It's not as strong, but it's on a different level. The comedy's on a different level, because we had uh, everything from pantomimes to uh, foreign movies to silent movies to uh, regular satire movies to um, uh, everyday life to uh, the professor to cool seas to progress Hornsby to uh, all these characters had a uh, space in the time. Looking back on them now, which ones stand out to you? Well, I couldn't tell you which one. It's, uh, I, I don't like them all, but uh, I like most of them. Yeah. Yes. But I think w in watching 10 from your show of shows, I think you're, you're absolutely right in saying that to say that they hold up, I think, is an understatement because they are just as funny. Yeah. And uh, that's incredible. Getting back to, uh, to Prisoner's Second Avenue, though, this is a show that uh, I think had an enormous run on Broadway, mm -hmm. very successful, as most of Simon's things I've done. Is it a fun show to do? Well, it's up to you. So you can dwell on the, on the tragedic part of it, or you can dwell on the fun part of it. And I would rather dwell on the fun part of it, because if you really analyze the play, the man is fired at the opening of the play <laughs> when he's saying, God, God, God. Uh, that means he's fired already, because yeah. when he comes out, he says, well, I wasn't fired today, I was fired Monday. So if you want to take it in the literal sense, uh, he's, uh, it's a very down play. But if you don't, you say, hey, losing your job is not the end of the world. It's a serious problem, and there's nobody taking anything away from that. It's serious. But it's not that serious. I mean, man's going to find another job, and he's gonna, he has a chance to find another I mean, there's not, all hope is not gone. Mm -hmm. And you can't play it that way. You've got to play it that he's going to find another job. And okay, this is an experience in his life where he was hurt very badly mentally, but that because he let himself be hurt. And if you play it that way and play it for fun, I think you get much more. I, I enjoy doing the play now, whereas before I would, uh, I'd have to put up with the play, you know, mm. uh, get under it and uh, try to do it. Now, the way I've, I've looked at it this time is to dwell mostly on the fun and also the people can understand what this guy's going through. Mm -hmm. And if he takes it with a little sense of humor, there's more sympathy for him because, hey, look, the guy's in a lot of trouble, yet he can laugh at himself, which is good. Do you think most plays are open to a sort of reinterpretation like that? Every play is open to reinterpretation. Hmm. Every play. There's no play that says that one way, that's it. You can't go any other way. You can play a play uh, 10, 15, 100 different ways. Do you constantly change each night? No, no, no. You get an attitude that you want to do. And, uh, yeah, we find little nuances that we can... Because you've got to keep it alive. Yeah. You can't just do it by rote. You know, I, you say that, I say this, I walk here, you walk there, I say this, you say that. That's no good. So you try to put little nuances in, try to find things a little bit more. Maybe I can get this a little more. Maybe I can get that. So there are different things you're constantly working on, which makes the play interesting for you, and therefore makes it interesting for the audience. You know, one thing that Ethel Merman told me one time, and, and goodness knows there have been few people as successful on Broadway as Ethel Merman, a rather strange statement. She said that if you come to see her play opening night and you come back six months later, you're going to see exactly the same play. That She says the best compliment anybody ever paid her was that watching her perform was like watching a film. Now, I don't know what, what really that means, because uh, that doesn't leave you open to much improvisation or different interpretation. Or well, everybody that? approaches their, their work differently. I mean, uh, that may work for her. Yeah. I mean, that's, I'm not, I'm not going to criticize <laughs> it. Because if it works for her, it's fine. And yeah. uh, there's nobody going to say that she, that she did wrong. Sure. What do you do, though, if an audience, for example, is not reacting the way you think they should? Well, you try to work with them. You, the, you can't give up on an audience. I mean, yeah. just because an audience is distracted for a few minutes, you have to expect that because they're looking at you. They're looking at the scenery. They're looking at you. They're looking at uh, how your voice sounds, how, what's, your, what's the relationship, what's going on. <coughs> Excuse me. And so uh, you mustn't give up on an audience, ever. 
you got to do your best all you can all the time. But can there be such thing as a collective bad audience? Oh yes, there are audiences that just don't want. They, they come. There was an audience on opening night in Little Me in New York. It cost uh, I think it was a thousand dollars a ticket. <laughs> they didn't come to see the show. They came to see each other. <laughs> And the best seats, the one they bid most for, were the seats in the back row. Then they wouldn't have to walk up the aisle, because the chauffeurs <laughs> were there waiting with the blankets and the oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. Incredible. That must have been, um, I would think, a, it was a big hit, a little me. Yes. Neil Simon, mm -hmm. again. You played in that for what, uh, four years ago, wasn't it? No, it was three years. I played a year on Broadway and a year on the road. You know, it was three years. And then I played it after. Yeah. Yeah. How year on the something you play that often, though. How do you, how do you keep it fresh? Is it as you, you say, invent just new things to go through? Yes, you have got to keep uh, because I was only off stage about four minutes yeah. out of the two and a half hours. I played eight different parts. I, oh. I met myself coming out. I said <laughs> goodbye to myself coming in. <laughs> Cy Coleman, who wrote the. Uh, I think the, the lovely score for Little Me has a big hit now on Broadway with... Uh, yeah, 20, 20 and Imogene century. is in that. That's She's right. She's doing very well, yeah. That's right. Do you, uh, do you see Imogene much? Yeah, once in a while. I see her about two, three times a year. Yeah. What about the other... Uh, some of the other Carl people? I see out there once in a while. I see Mel once in a while. I see Larry once in a while. I see Doc once in a while. Yeah. Hmm? Let me ask you about some of your films, um, this being Cinema Showcase. You made one which, uh, goodness knows, I think there were 20 or 30 great comic artist in. It's a mad, 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 mad world. Yeah. What kind of experience was that? Well, that's an experience where you uh, get to the studio or to location at 8 o'clock in the morning, and there are 17 comedians. <laughs> 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 and it's, it was amazing that uh, we got along very well together. Uh, one day it would be uh, Buddy Hackett that would go out, or Mickey Rooney, or uh, <laughs> Milton Berle, or uh, Jonathan Winters, or uh, pick anyone in Ben Blue. It's, uh, everyone would have a different time to go on. Yeah. And we're just sitting around because they take the uh, scope and look at it, and now the sun's not out yet, and uh, <laughs> that's it. So you sit around. We used to have bets. We used to have a pool every morning. We each put a dollar in the pool. And uh, to find out what time you think there was, he'd say, OK, let's start <laughs> shooting. Because you'd get there 8 o'clock. You wouldn't shoot till about 11, 11.30. Yeah. <laughs> so you sat around most of the day. You know, you're working with Stanley Kramer in that film, who had not previously been known for doing comedies. Um, was that any particular sort of challenge to make a film with a man who had been doing heavy, heavy drama? Yeah, he just came off doing a uh, trial at Nuremberg. Yeah. And uh, he wanted this, uh, wanted to direct it himself. And he was very, uh, he, there were some times when he was very, very uh, autocratic. He would, that's it, had to be done this way. And there were other times, he could be talked, and uh, you could talk to him about a scene and say, I think Stanley, if the scene went a little this way, and we didn't try to put too much heaviness, and he would agree with you. And uh, shoot with them, sometimes we shoot it both ways. Mm -hmm. We shoot it your way, and then shoot it Stanley's way, and see which way it wanted to work out. I remember one day, we were up in Palm Springs, we were about 3,000 feet up, <laughs> and uh, we had the scene on this mountain road, and we pulled off, and it was a very, very intricate scene because no two lines of dialogue matched anything other. It was just talking about the money that we we're going to split up. And you came down with one car. You came, we had one for being there, one for going down, and one for having a car. Yeah. Then you have one for so many people in your car. And, so <laughs> and I had the, the pleasure of putting that scene together, <laughs> which was tight. Oh. And we didn't get one shot in all day because he wanted a, a whole master. And this, thing, this scene took about, uh, oh, about almost five minutes, uh, five minutes of going straight yeah. on the master. And especially a scene that has no cues or anything because you have to come in, I go after you, you come after me because nothing makes any sense. So you have to go, you come after me, then after come, then you come after him, then I come after her, then you come after <laughs> he, and I come after her. So it was very, very uh, confusing. And after we finished shooting at 5.30, he said, uh, don't print anything. I said, why don't you print one frame? Just so I can take it home. And I try to get him along, you make him happy. He said, no. I said, all right. So that night I got together with all the guys, and we got together and we said, tomorrow let's knock it off in one shot. And we just rehearsed it. We said, no, forget what I'm talking about. You forget what I'm talking about. Just go by the numbers. That said, the first round is this, the first, second round is that. <laughs> and we died. We went out there on 8 o'clock the next morning, and uh, about the second take, we got the whole thing. And Stanley almost fell over. <laughs> we expected the scene to take about a week. <laughs> oh. 
Spencer Tracy was in that film, and yes. uh, did you, you really didn't have that many scenes. I had one scene with Spencer Tracy, and I looked forward to that mm -hmm. scene with such relish. I wanted to, I was waiting for the scene to come up, and finally the day, and he always left at four o'clock. Mm -hmm. And the scene came up during the day, and I was getting, they were setting up for the shot for Spencer uh, Tracy and myself. And uh, I was really looking forward to it. I said, gee, to be in a scene with Spencer Tracy, that to me is, that's really marvelous. And I was looking at my clock and watching, and I said, come on, set it up, set it up. <laughs> you know, sure enough, when four o'clock, he went in, went by. Said, okay, ready to shoot now. I said, yeah. And Phil, Phil Silvers read the uh, Spencer Tracy's lines. Yeah. But I, that's the way it goes. I would imagine, though, to, uh, but to, to uh, be in a film But being on the same set with Spencer yeah. was very, very, uh, I mean, I learned an awful lot from uh, Tracy, Spencer Tracy. I really did. I mean, he's a very nice man to talk to. Everybody says that the thing he did, and I, I would agree, better than I guess maybe any other actor, was that he gave the impression in a scene of listening. Yes. That you could, do, but you, he you did. could see him listen. But he did listen. That's why he was a great actor. Yeah. Because you have to listen to find out what's the intonation of what he's saying to you. You know the lines. Yeah. But how is he saying it to you? Right. And that's how you have to react, not to the lines, but to the attitude in which they're said. When young people come to you today and ask you what, advi what advice do you give them if they say they want to they wanna get into the business? Do you, do you advise them for or against? Well, it depends how serious they are. If they're really serious and they want to really go at it, I, uh, why deter them if, they, yeah. if that's what they want to do? Like we were just talking before, isn't it, a, isn't it a wonder in life to go to work and look forward yeah. to going to work? Yeah. You know, something that you like to do. So I wouldn't deter anybody who was really, really serious about uh, getting into the business. What is the best training ground, do you think, for them? The best training ground is to work, and to work at what you're doing, and work all the time. Work as much as you can. That's what it's because the more you work, every time you work, you get experience. Mm -hmm. Not only experience, and I have, uh, <laughs> oh, 25, 30 years of experience. Yeah. And I still learn. You have to learn. You must learn. You must keep on learning all the time. At the Harlequin, where I'm working now, <coughs> we have a cast. <coughs> it's uh, Carla Michaels and uh, Cy and uh, Gertrude. Uh, Muriel and uh, Harriet. We learn from each other every night mm -hmm. because we play it different every night. As you do it, you can feel that you have more confidence in doing this, more confidence in doing it. Because you constantly, if you don't feel a little twinge before you go on, it it's becomes mechanical. I yeah, guess. it's too mechanical, and you might as well give up. You have to have a little before you go on. It's mm -hmm. There's little butterflies that go on. I don't care if you've been on for a million years. It's gonna you're going to have them. Sure. And that's a good sign, I guess. Huh? Definitely, yes. That means you're, you, your adrenaline is flowing. You yeah. want to work. Yeah. I wonder, though, if, if, um, if, if trying to do television first today is better than, than, uh, than getting your, your, your groundwork in on the stage. Well, unfortunately, there's no place to try out today. I mean, there are very few places to try out, let's yeah. say that. And uh, there's no place actually to fall on your face, which is what you have to have. You have to have the, the place where I was, a, uh, I was lucky. I was up in the Catskill Mountains mm -hmm. as a kid. And I mean as a kid, performing up on a stage and being a musician. A saxophonist, weren't you? Saxophone, yeah. Kind of, yeah. And uh, I did things up there. I fell on my face, but I realized I fell on my face. Yeah. I said, hey, that's no good. Don't do that anymore. Don't take that kind of an approach. Try it this way, try it that way, which is a good place to learn. Mm -hmm. So that when it did come to something, I had some sort of experience to fall back on and some, s not tricks, but some sort of uh, a reliance on yourself to say, yes, I can do this. Yes, I can take this on. It's really a, a luxury almost, isn't it, to, uh, to be able to do that, too? Well, it's uh, because to be now able to when afford you, the luxury. Now thing. when you fail, if, if you're in, a, if you're in a, a, a TV series, you fail and that's it, you're never heard from. Not really. If you make a name for yourself, uh, if, of course, if you're in just a, if you just happen to get your break in that series, and mm -hmm. the series doesn't go. Yeah. But on the other hand, if you get a break in that series and the series goes, you're made. Yeah. But uh, it's the same what happened to me. I mean, I was no, nobody ever heard of me before. I did a movie and I did a Broadway show, but then I went to, to television, and that's where I got my name, and that's where I made my name, and I'm very thankful for it. Yeah. And you always are thankful for it. You never forget it. What are you doing? Uh, what follows Prisoner of Second Avenue for you? Well, we may do uh, some more. Prison Second Avenues, or we may, uh, I have to go back and do a pilot, and then I have to do uh, two movies, mm -hmm. and then, uh, but the pilot, and I may have to do, there's another pilot for them for two shows, actually. Great. Uh, Anyone yeah. you're particularly excited about? Or? Well, I don't like to talk about them, because if you talk about them, it never happens. Yeah. 
and it's, uh, talking about something that may happen or may not. But the chances are that it has a good chance of going. Let me ask you one question that, um, that uh, something Noel Coward once said that he said that most great comedy actors or, or, or comic actors can very, very effectively generally play drama, oh, but yes. not necessarily the other way around. That's very true. Because it's like you see an acrobat on a diving board. He's a clown. Yeah. Well, to be able to take those dives, he has to be a very, very excellent diver. Otherwise, you get hurt very bad. When you take a dive off the top of a high diving board and, you, and a clown's out, but you still hit the water. Yeah. Like if you're hitting it, uh, yeah. that water can be as hard as concrete if you hit it the wrong way. So you have to be an excellent diver to do anything um, comedic style. Mm -hmm. So you have to be some sort of an actor to portray any kind of a character in comedy. And if you want to press it, uh, the, uh, it can go from comedy to tragedy very fast. Yeah. See, tragedy can go into comedy. It's like when you laugh too hard, you start to cry. Mm -hmm. Tears come to your eyes. You laugh so hard, tears right. come to your eyes, right? And if you cry too hard, you start to laugh. Somebody hmm. gets hysterical, right? Yeah. Because they're crying too hard, they start to laugh. So it's almost one and the same emotion. And by trying to straddle that, that's where it's hard for the comedian which way to go. Because it, this, any situation can go, can go tragically or comedically. Yeah. We are out of time. <coughs> this has so been fast? A, this has been a fast half hour. I hope you've enjoyed yeah. it. Very nice, Jim. Thank you. And um, I hope everybody will go see you in Prisoner 2nd Avenue at the Harlequin and come back to Atlanta real soon. I certainly will. It's treated me very well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. My thanks to all of you for watching. Until next time, good night. Thank you.